Yo, what's up? Welcome back to Psychopath Exposure. My name is Kira. Today we're going to be talking about the hatchet-wielding hitchhiker, which so happens to be the number one watched movie on Netflix right now. It's a freaking documentary. Like, how? I mean, just the fact that I even watched it, I feel dumber by watching it because I didn't know about this guy. This is a documentary. This is a true story about a guy, Caleb Lawrence McGillivray. I probably mispronounced his name, and I don't give a rat's ass that I did. Um, but he went by the tag Kai back in 2013. And I see this on the Netflix number one watched movie. I'm here thinking maybe this is going to be a cool horror movie like Hatchet or The Hitcher. If you guys have seen those movies. Um, but no, it, it, it's, it's one of the stupidest things that I have ever seen. And it shows how brain dead society has become where a guy like this went completely viral. And spoiler alert, because by the way, we're going to be getting into some serious spoilers here. So if you don't want to be spoiled, go watch the documentary on your own. But spoiler alert, this dimwit ended up being sentenced uh, to serve a 57, year, uh, 57 years in prison. I mean, holy crap. What the hell is this? Let me tell you a little bit about what this movie or documentary is all about. So, so this guy, Kai, he's a hitchhiker, a homeless hitchhiker. And as the documentary starts, he's being interviewed. And he's talking about that he was hitchhiking. He got picked up by this guy, uh, Jet McBride, who he claims was 300 pounds. And the guy was claiming to be Jesus Christ. That's how this whole thing starts. So the 300-pounder McBride suddenly crashes into a, pede uh, to a pedestrian, um, pinning pinning the person to, to the back against like the, the truck and the front of the vehicle. So, devastating accident. So, Kai gets out of the car to help the pedestrian, and then another Good Samaritan a bystander comes to help as well. But then 300-pounder McBride jumps out of the car, and he, starts, he grabs the pedestrian in a bear hug. So, as Kai says in his interview, he's like, this guy's 300 pounds, he could... He could Snap her neck like a pencil stick. So I grabbed a hatchet like for my backpack. That's what he's saying. He, he, he has a hatchet in his, in his backpack. And no one, no one thinks that this is um, dangerous or, or weird or strange. There's no, no red flags here whatsoever. It's homeless guy walking around with a freaking hatchet. Anyway, he just, he just, I, just, I just started hitting the guy with a hatchet. And the, the video went viral because he's like, He's like, so I went to smash, smash, smash. And that little clip went viral in 2013. This guy just blew up with that, when that little clip got put into the internet. But what, what boggles my mind is how they let this guy go. He was just interrogated quickly by the police. Yeah, they took the hatchet away, but they, they just let him go. I, I don't think that that's how things normally work. That's just weird how that just happened. So the guy was just walking away, and this, this, um, this guy that I guess he was a sports anchor, and it was his first day covering news, he approached them and he started inter um, interviewing him. And he, you know, that, that, what does the media do? They're always looking for the next big hit. So they thought, ooh, this homeless guy, and he saved the day, what a hero. A homeless hitchhiker, what a hero. Um, but yet, the red flags are all, all over the place. He had a freaking hatchet. He just smashed this guy in the head. And he's bragging about how he was smashing him, how he was just cleaving him, and he was proud of it. No one sees these type of red flags, because that, that's... It, that was like unnecessary violence. You, you, you know what I'm saying? It's just strange the things that happen in, in this world. But it's just funny because red flags are always ignored when a person has charm. And this guy, for some reason or another, people felt that he was super charming, Mr. Gnarly Surfer Boy. This kid did, does not impress me. All right? Um, I think he's a dumbass. I couldn't stand the second I saw him on the camera. And um, I wouldn't have thought that he was a psychopath or anything like that at first. 
but his antics, his, his little surfer attitude, his little positive little messages that he gave and, and whatever, I don't see him like some sort of messiah or any grand savior or anything like that. I think uh, some, some, some hobo who's stoned out of his freaking mind and he's carrying a freaking hatchet. That's like a little axe, by the way, for those that know, know, don't know what a hatchet is. Um, but it's just interesting how, how, how the cops just, just let him go in a situation like that. Maybe because he was homeless, they didn't feel that he was a threat or something like that. I, I don't think he had ID with him. Um, and he just would have just gone out and walked into the sunset and nobody would have ever found him again. So it's interesting, but um, you know, you guys should watch the film The Hitcher so you can see a true psychopath when you're hitchhiking and you let people into your car. You don't know who that's gonna be. In the film The Hitcher, and I'm probably gonna make a review about it, about it because that, that's a real psychopath that gets in the car with that kid. And uh, they force you to do things. You don't know who you're bringing into your car. You don't know that person has a gun, if they're a killer. And um, you know, the first thing that popped into my mind I was like, why didn't the cops like, wonder, hey, what if this kid was behind the whole thing? Or what if this kid somehow forced the 300-pounder the McBride to, to drive into that, into that person? Like, it's just strange. It's a hitchhiker. And you don't know much about this guy. I don't know. I, maybe because I saw the film, I would have been thinking about that. But they just let him go. And it is what it is. Now, of course, the snakes of Hollywood... What do they want to do? They want to turn this freaking zero into a hero to make a quick buck. All right? That's what they do. They want to make a quick buck out of a homeless covert killer and glorify his behavior. And it's great that he defended that lady, but it's just the way, the way he talks about how he was cleaving the guy. That's a red flag to me. And you just can't let a guy go around without any type of ID, just let's just let this guy go. Who, what else is, what if he had a machete and he would have cut the guy's head off? It's just, doesn't sit right with me. But great message for the kids, by the way. Just be a hobo, smoke weed, drink whiskey all day, as you're gonna, as you'll see if you watch the documentary and as I'm gonna cover, this guy's a total, total fuck up. Slaughter people with hatchets, right? Um, you'll get insta-famous kids if that's what you do. And, and that's what I feel that is going on with Hollywood as they try to glorify people that don't deserve this type of fame and can't even handle it. And here we are, 10 years after the events, because that was in 2013. Now Netflix has themselves a number one movie. While that psychopath, half-wit, jackass, blockhead murderer rots in a cell for the next 57 years, because that was his sentence. So, let's go ahead. I took some notes. I want to go step by step of what this jackass did and how quickly he went from zero to hero back to zero. Or actually, from zero to hero to 57 years in a hole. It's just insane. But this is what the media likes to do so they can get themselves a story. So first things first, um, this gnarly psycho surfer jackass. Okay, the first thing he does when he's being interviewed by that guy right after the incident. First thing he does, okay, which I look at it now and it's, it's kind of like in hindsight, he's excusing his past behaviors, a little foreshadowing. But the first thing he says is, is just so uncanny. He gets on camera, he's like, oh, dude, no matter what you've done, you deserve respect. Even if you make mistakes, be lovable. It doesn't matter your looks, skills, or age, or size, or anything, dude. You're worthwhile. No one can ever take that away from you. Blah, 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 blah. It's like, all right, skater boy from Dogtown, spare me the goddamn Hallmark slogans, all right? I don't want to hear that shit. All right, you're being interviewed because you're you basically smashed some guy with a hatchet who had just dro driven into somebody with his car, and then he was attacking another lady, and you're giving all this hippie shit. It's just weird, and when you know the whole story, you can you can see that that was him kind of trying to um, deflect and distract and just spread positivity. So the last thing you think is that maybe he has a history 
of murder. Maybe he has a history of attacking people with hatchets. So by spreading that positive message, you know, um, people are like, oh, wow, what a great guy, right? What a great guy. Just look at this homeless guy. Most homeless people are miserable, but here's a homeless guy spreading, spreading positivity, right? No. I see shit like that as very uncanny. I see shit like that very, very uncanny, and I, I, I don't overlook, and I don't give people like that the benefit of the doubt anymore. Not after having dealt with psychopaths in my life. So, again, I don't see how the cops just let him go. But anyway, moving right along. What does the media want to do? They want to make him famous. They want to get him on Jimmy Kimmel, which is a great show, especially 10 years ago. He was, he was on top with Letterman. Um, they want to turn him into a superhero. The producers of the Keeping Up With The Kardashians show wanted to give this guy, Kai, his own show. Uh, unbelievable. The Kardashians show, uh, I, I don't even want to talk about that one, but yeah, they want to give the, this, this nobody his own show. Just, let's continue glorifying trash, by the way, because that's what Hollywood producers do. Um, you know, at some point, this, this part was funny, they, they present him with a contract, I think it was to get him on the Kimmel show, and um, he signs the contract <laughs> in hieroglyphics. It wasn't even his name. It was just a bunch of shapes. A bunch of stuff that, that he himself probably can't even decipher. Uh, and he's a brain that's psycho. I mean, can you not see the red flags? Can, can these people not see who they were, that they were dealing with a mental person? I mean, they're trying to give this guy all this fame, which comes with a lot of money, and the guy can't even sign his name properly in a contract. A, a child knows how to do something like that. And, and this kid, this, eh, let's just draw some triangles and squares on, on, in the middle of the contract. It wasn't even in the line where it says sign here. In the middle of the contract. He's just drawing on that shit like a retard. It, it's, it's crazy. You want to make this guy famous and, and turn him into a hero. Okay, yeah. So we fast forward. Now we're in, in Los Angeles and they arrive at a fancy hotel. Before this dumbass even goes inside the hotel, they're outside in the walk of shame, he pees on Julio Iglesias' star, on, the, on, the, on his Hollywood star. By the way, that's Enrique Iglesias' father, for those that don't know. Um, two famous singers. Um, but yeah, so he's bragging about, he's bragging, but that's the thing. You just peed on Julio Iglesias' star, first of all. Like, why don't you go pee in a bathroom? Like, you're, you're being given an opportunity. You're, taking, you're being taken to this fancy hotel. Like, your life is about to change, dude. Dude, right? You're not, like, it's, it's like you're being taken out of the streets and you're going to be given this incredible opportunity. Opportunity, can I even say the word right? You're being given this incredible op opportunity to turn your life around. And it's being handed to you on a platter. And the first thing you do is you take a piss outside on the Walk of Fame. And you brag about it like an entitled toxic man-child. Oh my God. Oh. Anyway, he gets to the room. And uh, first he starts pounding on those bottles of Jack Daniels, like a freaking alcoholic, right? And this is a fancy hotel. These aren't like little travel-sized little liquor bottles. These are like um, what Slash from Guns N' Roses would, would, be, would be chugging before shows, all right? What a dumbass. Just, that's the first thing he wants to do. Like, never mind trying to clean up your act. You're in a fancy hotel with important people and producers that are trying to make you a star. No, you wanna go and just get completely shit-faced right away. Awesome. Let's continue to, to glorify trash. Let's continue to give this guy more and more opportunities. In the documentary, you see, you see the people around them, and they're, as they're telling their story, that they were like, why is this guy doing... You know, it, it, it wasn't making sense to them. And yet, they kept moving forward with the plan. Like, those the red flags everywhere let's just ignore them and keep going because you see that's what happens when when you have psychopathic energy around you 
All logic goes out the window. The red flags are, are in front of your face, your gut screaming at you, and it's telling you, hey, this dude is dangerous. And what do you do? You're like, oh well, shut the fuck up, idiot voice. Let's go ahead and double down on the situation. Well, that's why things continue to get worse. It's Saturday night now, still at the fancy hotel. You know how these hotels are Saturday night with, uh, in those lounges and um, important people in cocktail dresses and nice suits. And this guy just skates through the cobblestone floor in the middle of the lobby like a man-child, like, like something a five-year-old would do. And then the parents would immediately take the skateboard away and put them in timeout. But what does this idiot do? Oh, let's just go ahead and skateboard like a dumbass through the lobby. Cobblestone floor. Have you ever skateboarded on cobblestone, cobblestone floor before? It makes really loud, a really loud sound. It sucks. Um, so security kicks them out right away. It kicks everybody out. They kick everybody out. All right? Again, if that's, is, is that a red flag? No! Let's continue. Let's double down some more. At this point, they're romanticizing this kid to being this vigilante, this Robin Hood, Batman type of character. They point out how he stole from a grocery store and he filled this cart full of food and stuff and then he just gave it away to, to, some, to some other homeless people. So it's like, oh, wow. Oh, Mr. Robin Hood, you steal from the rich and give to the poor. No, that's not how the real world works. But they see it and they let him get away with it. It continues. I mean, it doesn't take a genius to see that this is an unhinged loser with a drinking and drug problem. He's burned out all the time. A total wreck. Careless, irresponsible scavenger. No respect for authority. A loose cannon, highly toxic, mental person. They don't see it. So, okay, so we move on and it's Jimmy Kimmel showtime. They get to the studio. Before he even goes into the studio, he immediately pisses on the sidewalk outside because why not? Sounds like a good idea. Um, the enabling of the bad behavior doesn't stop. It continues. Now Jimmy Kimmel, Jimmy Kimmel gives him an envelope with $500. What does dumbass do? He turns around and gives the $500 to the security guard and says, oh, sorry, dude, sorry for pissing on your floor. Again, you got to recognize the bonehead decisions that this hatchet-wielding homeless hitchhiker is making. Not only is it stupid to go piss on, on the sidewalk of the studio of the freaking Jimmy Kimmel show that people would just die to, 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 to be on, not only is that a bonehead decision, but then life gives you $500 for free. It just, once again, hands it to you on a platter, okay? That's for you to survive, to secure food and shelter. Remember, you're a hobo, okay? This way, you don't have to scam people. You don't have to be a hobo forever. Here's $500. But again, this is the kind of dumbass decision. And it's foreshadowing for the rest of the dim-witted decisions that this loser continued to make and continues to make until ultimately he, he lands in jail for the rest of his fucking life like a fucking idiot. So these are the things that you gotta see and you know what, the media, the snowflakes, they see this as a generous, empathic act of kindness. But it's really an act of stupidity. Gosh, unreal. It's so frustrating, I swear, it's like being on TikTok and you feel dumber after spending five minutes on it. That's how I felt watching the dumb shit that this idiot would do and how these producers kept trying to make him famous. They wouldn't just pull the plug on it. Man. So here's what's funny. So the cops show up about an hour and a half before the Kimmel show goes on. And uh, they detain Kai because they felt that he was the... What better witness in the Jeff McBride um, preliminary hearing that they were going to have? Okay, I mean, Kai was the passenger. He was the hitchhiker. So we need to get his testimony. So the cops, they take him. Um, 
They take them from the studio right away. I mean, this is 90, 90 minutes before they go they, before they go live. Now, it's funny. Before the cops even showed up, showed up, they had no idea where this kid was. Again, this guy could be anywhere. He's a homeless dude. But Jimmy Kimmel tweeted who was going to be on the show, and the cops found him. So 90, 90 minutes before the show, they show up, and they detain him. Anyway, they bring him back 30 minutes before the show starts, so he gets there on time. And my God, the show was an utter disaster. What, what a train wreck, okay? What a train wreck. I mean, I've seen famous children conduct themselves better in talk shows than this man-child. Unbelievable. There's no way this guy wasn't stoned out of his mind completely, but Jimmy Kimmel did a great job in keeping things in control. You know, he likes to use that self-deprecating humor and, and just shift the attention and things like that when, when things are about to spiral out of control. So I thought he did a great job, but it was very cringy to watch. And um, here we go again, rewarding this imbecile with, with bad behavior, right? Let's reward him with a brand new surfboard and a wetsuit for basically being a cretin on set. Why would this guy want to change? Why would this guy want to stop being a jerk? Why would this guy want to stop? What would inspire this guy to stop being a complete loser when they're handing things to him on a platter? Makes no sense. Just makes no sense. You know? So, whatever. That was a train wreck. Afterwards, they try to make him into like one of those movie review guys. Guy couldn't focus for a minute. He couldn't focus for a minute on the film, on the trailer of the film, on the topic of the film. Couldn't do it. So that's when they, they start realizing that a, a reality show with this guy is just out of the question. He's not going to be able to pull it off. But... Sadly, no matter what the idiot does or say, the internet loved him. He was an internet sensation. That kid went viral. And um, remember, this was 2013. If it was now, he'd probably be even bigger, the way social media spreads now versus 10 years ago. Unreal. Anyway, I wanted to cover what went on at the pretrial hearing for Jet McBride for the 300-pounder. Um, so Kai is called as a key witness and um, the gnarly hatchet hero. He can't even raise the correct hand to go under oath. Fucking imbecile. He's there, he's holding his left hand. Okay, he first holds up his left hand, th then he puts up both hands. And the judge is like, the judge has to remind them only the right hand is needed. Listen to the clerk. Let the clerk speak and let her read you the oath so you can respond. You clueless buffoon. He didn't say that, but I'm saying that. So Kai was asked at the, at the hearing if he rolled a joint with, Jeff, with Jet, um, Jet McBride. And he said he did. Now, when McBride was being interviewed by the cops, he had suggested that Kai made the assumption after they smoked that now they were both ghosts right after they, they were done. And uh, Kai had said, I bet that we could drive right through that truck right now and no one would even see us. You know, little things like that. You, you hear things like that and it's like, hmm, that's strange. So one of the cops thinks that Kai actually had a culpability. Culpability. Right? So he believed that Kai had some fault in this situation. And even though he's made out to be a hero, he doesn't see him that way. So I'm glad we have a smart cop in this documentary. It gives us hope. <sighs> but even as uh, Kai is giving his testimony at the hearing, and this, is, this, this really pissed me off, he's doing the smash antic. He's, he's telling the story. And again, instead of conducting himself like a professional, just, or just a calm person, just being your best behavior, you're in court for crying out loud. He's getting all into the, the antics because he wants to go viral again. He's there, yeah, so smash, so smash, so smash that like button. You know, obliterate that subscribe button as well while you're at it. Um, but yeah, it's just so cringe and it's so weird and he thinks this whole thing is a joke. And people can't see through this. I mean, what the hell? What the hell is going on with society? 
I mean, this is making a quick buck, you know, getting this guy famous, because obviously the producers who, who discover him or whatever are going to make a killing. But look who you're Look who you're glorifying. You're glorifying complete trash that has that does, does not really have anything of positive influence. It, it's it's scumbag shit that you're promoting and glorifying. What the actual fuck? Okay, so you know how documentaries are. They're they're edited to create drama, obviously, and, and rile up your emotions. So now that you've seen what you've seen. Now it cuts back to the, the original interviewer, and now he's talking about how off-camera, or maybe not off-camera, but not necessarily what he submitted to the news. Part of the interview, he had asked Kai if he had ever been in a situation like this, this type of life-threatening situation. And Kai, Kai said, yeah, one time I was in Orchard, and there was this guy he starts beating on this woman who he calls his own. So I started smashing him in the head, you know, and then smashing him in the teeth, busted up his teeth. And then he goes and he shows his hand to the camera. To, and he's like, you see the scars? I still have teeth marks on the scars. So again, it's like he's glorifying that he beat someone up, that he smashed someone up. Again, right like seconds probably before he was glorifying that he cleaved this other person on the head three times with a freaking hatchet. How is this overlooked? My God, how is this overlooked? It's like he's proud of it. He's proud of it. And <clears throat> anyway, you see, this is what happens when you try to make a hero out of a psycho. This is not Dexter Morgan, guys. This is not Dexter Morgan. Don't even try it. This guy doesn't hold a candle to Dexter. Anyway, moving right along. So now it cuts to this band, I don't know, a local band called the Redcoats, and they're interviewing the singer. Gabriel Francisco and supposedly they had asked him if they wanted to play a show with Kai so it's one of those things when you're trying to make it as a band and you get to play a show with a, a more famous band or a famous person or anything that can get you more views or more uh, fans you're gonna do it so so they did it but of course it, it's just full of disaster so they're interviewing the manager of the venue Tony Martin and come showtime, and Kai comes in for the sound check, you know, he's, Tony's talking about how, how he was put off by Kai right away. Uh, as soon as he walked in, he's already demanding free liquor from the bar. And Tony's like, no, this is not how we do it around here. You know, stop being so entitled. So Kai was bragging to the singer of the band. Then they were having like a private conversation. And he was talking about how, going back to the initial incident with 300-pounder McBride, um, he was talking about how he, he handed him a joint. But then he's like, but he had no idea that joint was laced, dude. So it's like, what? You know, by the way, that means it was, it was spiked with other drugs, shit like that. It wasn't just marijuana. And he's all proud of it. And um, so the guy's like, whoa, did Kai just confess that he drugged this guy? Because you give someone a joint, but if you don't tell them that it's laced with other shit. You're drugging the person. So I was like, how, how was this missed, right? And I know they, they did, um, what, do they, what do they call those toxicology um, tests on McBride and, and only marijuana showed up. But again, you never know. Sometimes things are missed. That you don't know what you're exactly looking for. Maybe there's other tests that you can do. I don't know how that exactly works, but it's, you know, you got this guy saying shit like this. You don't know what's real. You don't know what's not. But the more information you get the more pieces of this puzzle start to start to fit in um, and that's that's what I find that's what I find so um, so scary about this whole story so then you know they continue talking Gabriel and, and Kai and again Kai goes into that whole very positive very hippie attitude he starts talking about all all, all, all the Hallmark slogans again but then he breaks character and when he breaks character and he's like, you know, imagine he's saying all this positive shit, right? And then you break character and you go into a rant of, unless an old man bangs you in the ass and has you up all night and you have to keep it real and take him out. I was like, where did that come from? Like, did you, did an old man sexually assault you and, and you took him out? 
Like, where is, where is this passive-aggressive shit coming out? And it just comes out of nowhere. See, when you're dealing with a psychopath, you're going to see cracks in their mask like this all the time. These are the cracks in the mask of a psychopath. When things like this come out, and it's like, whoa, where did that come from? And then you're, you're so confused, you're afraid to call it out, and you just nod, and you accept it, and you move on, but it keeps you up all night, because you know what you heard. You know what you saw. But apparently here, nobody has a conscience, except for Gabriel, and that one cop. So, anyway, they, they ended up playing their show. After the show, the manager of the venue... Kicked Kai out because what did he do? He peed in the bushes. Because <laughs> why not, right? This guy doesn't know what a bathroom is. So, <sighs> unreal. Unreal. More stuff as the interviews continue. More red flags come out. Now he, he, he talks about how he was raped when he was 17 while he was on the road. And he was locked in a cage for four years by his mom. And he was treated like an animal. You know, it's hard to identify what's real and what's not. When you're dealing with a psychopath, you get a lot of half-truths. You get warped, distorted versions of the truth that are designed to get a reaction from you or plant a seed. And that's what we start seeing from this guy, from this Mr. Hatchet-wielding hitchhiker. So we get into the crux of the documentary now. This is the end, and now they introduce Joe Galfi. This is a 73-year-old uh, lawyer. And supposedly, he, he had gone missing. They were interviewing the neighbors. The neighbors realized, hey, something's wrong. His newspaper is still in the front porch. I think he had like two newspapers in the front porch. In the front porch. In the front porch. How, how did I flip those? Um, and it's very uncanny for that because he always reads his newspaper. So they call the cops, detectives. They started investigating the home, taking photographs. And then they found a ticket, a train ticket on the table and um, so they requested video footage from the New Jersey Transit and they got it in the video footage you see Mr. Galfi buying a train ticket and giving it to Kai now remember Kai is supposed to be in California and now suddenly he's in in the Jersey area so he gives them the ticket and then they hug right you can tell it's like a good luck type of hug type of thing right the old man is giving him a ticket, good luck son, type of deal. More on that later. So all of a sudden, Kai starts posting some cryptic messages on Facebook. Again, more red flags. Like these, these mentally disturbed psychos, they just can't help but leave clues that give themselves away later. And you know what? Let me read to you what that cryptic message was. Um... Because there, there were various ones, but they're, they're scary. One of them goes, First memories, I was in a crib and family was fussing over me. But I kept getting told that I had a demon. I would get locked in a room for 20 hours a day with a little porta potty camp toilet in the corner of the room. Then after that, my mouth filled with hot peppers and soap for yelling, Fuck you! at the top of my lungs. Interesting. Again, it's like, his traumatic childhood is coming up and he's posting it. Here's one that's, that was also messed up. And this comes, th this one really got people's attention. He goes, what would you do if you woke up with a groggy head, metallic taste in your mouth in a stranger's house, walked to the mirror and seen cum dripping from the side of your face from your mouth, and started retching, realizing that someone had drugged, raped, and blown their fucking load in you. What would you do? Hmm. You know, when I read a message like that, he's, he's not asking what would you do, like give me advice. It sounds like he's done something, and he's trying to, and it's like the way I read it is like, yeah, you know, what would you do in that situation? Because this is what I did. But what would you do? What would anybody do? And, you know, those little things. You know what his fans replied? One of them was like, find them as fast as I could and smash the shit out of them with a hatchet or whatever else I could find. And he replies, I like your idea. 
in true psychopathic form. <sighs> the plot thickens, guys. The plot thickens. They realized that 73-year-old Joe Galfi was murdered. They found his body in his home. There's blood spatter everywhere, the hallways, the kitchen, you name it. Kai is a suspect now. Somehow they got him. They found him pretty quickly. Uh, pretty quickly. Um, towards the end of the documentary now, you see he's speaking with two officers in, in, in those private rooms. You know how they like to talk to you? They bring you coffee and water, and they, they try to get a confession from you. So they're talking to him, and he gives his story. He said he met Joe Galfi in Times Square. He offered him a place to stay. They had dinner, drank some beers, and watched TV, and then later went to bed. Kai says when he woke up, he felt like he had been sexually assaulted. But he didn't confront the guy. He didn't confront the old man. Instead, they went to the train station, and Joe got him a train ticket to Asbury and said, if you need a place to stay, call or email me. Now, let's go back to that video footage that we saw on the, on the surveillance on the New Jersey Transit Station. If you just got sexually assaulted by a stranger... Not your husband or your wife, not someone that you've been trauma bonded with over time, a stranger, and you get out. Why would you be hugging them, embracing them, and hanging out with them? Why don't you run for your life? And it gets worse. Because that very same night, he couldn't find a place to, to stay, so he called Mr. Galfi again and went back to his house to spend the night. So you're embracing your abuser. You're going back to your abuser's house, even though you've been free all this time. And this is a 73-year-old man. It's not like he's chasing you. He, he's not going to catch you. He's not going to outrun you. What are you thinking? How does that, see, that story does not make sense. If you've been on this channel long enough, you know we talk about trauma bonds here. And you know it takes many months and years to develop a trauma bond where you continue going back to your abuser. This doesn't make any sense. This guy, he's trying to, he's trying to use the self-defense card. And it's just, it's not working. It's not working. So yeah, he ended up going back to the old man's house. He claimed that once again... He woke up and the old man was trying to pull his pants down, yada, yada, yada. Bullshit, I don't buy it. So Kai claims that he hit him to get him off him. Cops ask him, uh, what you hit him with? He's like, oh, I don't know, my hands, uh, elbows, uh, might have kicked him. See, he, he, he doesn't know. Remember at the beginning of, of, of the story when he's talking about the smash, smash, how into detail, how perfectly detailed he is and, and tells you precisely what he did. Now he has no idea what he did. He has no idea how he hit his abuser. Come on, dude. Um, Self-defense. There would have been scratches on, on his arms. Because remember, he's saying that the old man was attacking him. So there would be bruises, scratches, all sorts of um, proof that there was a struggle. But he was completely clean. No cuts, bruises, scratches, nothing. He was completely clean. On the other hand... 73-year-old Joe Galfi looked like he was beat to death over and over and over again and stomped. That's right. That's what the forensics team discovered. What a fucking psychopathic jackass. Unbelievable. So, you know, justice was served. Justice was served. Thank goodness this loser, in the end, he was sentenced to 57 years in prison. And it's a maximum, maximum security prison, too. And it's interesting, at the end of the video, there's like a, a short clip where he's saying that justice was not served or his attorney threw the case and, and how come rape victims should get um, more sympathy. I, I, you know, I, I forgot exactly what he said now, but he's using a normal voice. Gone is that little gnarly surfer stoned voice, that, that, that character that he was playing. Now he's talking like a, like a normal human being. That's interesting to, to note, too. But uh, 
Anyway, there you go, folks. Another dim-witted psychopath idiot gets what he deserves. But not before ruining the lives of an innocent man. And God knows how many other unknown victims are out there that haven't been discovered. Because this piece of shit has been hinting at it. He gave more than enough, more than enough cryptic messages and little things he would say here and there that tell me, I believe he's done this before. I mean, he even confessed to have done something like this before. So those are the ones that we know. Those are the ones that were caught. God knows what else he's done. And that's how it is when you're working with psychopaths and narcissists. And I don't, I don't mean to say working. I meant to say dealing with. Because you're only going to see what they want you to see. Or sometimes you only see what, where they slipped. Right? Where they slipped and they got caught. But they usually have a history. They usually have a track record. They usually, you know, it's not the first time they've done this. This is not their first rodeo. There's a trail. And I'm pretty sure this axe-wielding dimwit had been doing this for a while. He seems like a kid. You, still, you see those interviews with the mom, too. And they talk about his, his uh, childhood. He didn't have a good childhood. So, so you, you can tell that a lot of this stuff came from his childhood. He's got a lot of pent-up resentment, a lot of passive aggressiveness. I believe his cousin was interviewed also. He was also in the documentary. There's a lot of shit in there about this guy. This guy is dangerous. This guy is unhinged. This guy is unstable. This guy is mental. This is a psycho. And there you have it. It all came out. It took him, I think, what, three months? He went viral and three months later, he's fucked. Unbelievable. Anyway, that's my little review. If you want to go ahead and watch it, or if you've seen it, let me know what you thought about this clown. And um, if you've been through something like this, if you've experienced a psychopath, if you know somebody that, that has a history or is hinting at shit like this, keep your eyes open. Do not bring those people into your home. Do not give these people rides to work. Do not help these people whatsoever because they are deranged. You have no idea how they'll, they'll flip on you. You have no idea if they're carrying weapons of any kind or what they'll do, what um, element of psychosis they might go through, um, especially if they're using and they're drinking bottles of Jack Daniels like this clown. Stay away from people like that if you know them. And by all means, do not try to make someone like that famous. Wish Hollywood was taking notes. Anyway, thanks for watching. This is Psychopath Exposure, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Have a good one.